Cool. So let me turn off the waiting room and spotlight you, Lindsay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Give folks, a moment to uh, get in the meeting, get their cup of coffee and their cup of tea and sit down at their home computers. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, everybody. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. I decided to go with the virtual background of Greece to mix it up and think of a place, a faraway place. It'd be pretty nice to be right now. We'll go ahead and get started. We have a good uh, group here this morning. Uh, welcome to the digital dialogue with ACTLA about the graceful transition to online tutoring. Um, it is May 5th and early morning for those of us on the West Coast, so welcome everyone. Um, as many of you know, we would have had a conference uh, about two weeks ago, and because of everything going on, we of course couldn't have our physical conference, our face-to-face -face conference, but what we wanted to do is then offer um, you know, these digital dialogues as a way to connect, but also um, you know, bring what's happening in the field to light and, you know, connect with our greater community here. So I'm going to share my screen with you all in just a second with just a couple housekeeping things. This is being recorded. Um, if you have questions, please filter those through the chat. We'll be monitoring those. And um, Edward, who will be our moderator, will then be asking our panelists those questions. Um, so just to go ahead and remain muted and use the chat uh, for those questions. So just give me a moment. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So we have three facilitators this morning. We have Edward Polert, who's going to be facilitating our panelists. Um, he is the current ACLA president, which he'll be soon passing that baton. Um, I'm Lindsay Laney, the ACTLA past president. And we have Johanna Dvorak, our ACTLA uh, research coordinator. Our panelists that we have are Araceli Badia from American River College. David Galvez from UC San Diego and Timurhan Vengo from CSU Long Beach. And they'll get a chance to introduce themselves more fully um, when we start the panel. But what we first wanted to do is actually provide you all with a little context about um, our organization and how we got to where we are. Um, so our organization actually um, helped create online tutoring standards and I'll pass it over to Johanna Dvorak, who will tell you a little bit more. Oh, good morning, everyone, and glad you could join us this morning. I had the privilege of being part of developing the online tutoring standards. Um, I work as a director of the Learning Center at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and we really got underway with web conferencing about 2010. Um, but uh, this effort started around 2017 in California and with ACLA, uh, to really try to develop standards as we're all trying to uh, strive to do the best thing we can do. In our case, we were starting to offer online courses and we had to provide online academic support for those that couldn't come in in person. And I imagine, of course, now things have really exploded, but um, that effort really got developed uh, on our campus about 10 years ago. Uh, and I was part of a group that um, uh, help, I helped to create surveys and participate in surveys and focus groups through uh, at the different CLA DEA annual conferences in the year of 2018 and 19. Uh, and through that process, we narrowed down from about 10 categories to four major categories of what would the tops or the standard be for providing online tutoring. So we're going to go through each of those four categories today and give you some examples 
And um, I'm going to turn it back to Lindsay then to tell you the timeline. Thank you. So like Johanna mentioned, uh, the process was really over a year long of developing the standards. Uh, there was a survey that was sent out in early of probably January 2018. And then we met um, at the ACTLA annual conference in San Diego, um, where we had a wide variety of representation of different Claudia member associations and other folks from for-profit online tutoring companies and other leaders with online tutoring. Um, and then through that year, we um, were able to consolidate the topics. Uh, like Johanna mentioned, we had 10 and we narrowed it down to five and then we're able to modify um, over the course of the year with additional feedback and extensive um, you know, information from other folks in the field. And then last spring in 2019, we were able to finally roll out the ACLA online tutoring standards to the field um, and that was at our annual conference. So like we mentioned, there was four. Um, and so the first two are just gonna briefly go through our infrastructure and meaningful engagement. Um, so infrastructure really has to do with not only access um, and accessibility, but also the type of delivery and then those resources that are available to students. And then really at the core of, um, of it all is in the meaningful engagement. You know, how are you engaging the students in a meaningful way in an online environment um, and trying to replicate as best as possible that face to face tutoring, you know, that was happening in our centers. Just to give you some examples of this, uh, I think really the infrastructure seemed is the area that most of us are really working on how to get this to work properly and to really provide reliable uh, delivery of our services. Uh, but we do have to look at five areas and I, I urge you to check on each of these to make uh, your program go smoothly. You want to be sure that you've got the budget and you're following the mission of your campus. You've got to have a reliable delivery with a, a robust technology, uh, a web conferencing platform. Uh, you also need to have, be able to market your program. So you're going to get the students to use it and uh, to feel comfortable coming in. And accessibility is a really big area that we talked about because we want to be able to uh, provide this service to all of our students and the technology just has to be ADA compliant. So uh, the standards actually go into a list of, of points that are made about each one of these five areas. Uh, so this is a big area that we uh, kind of narrowed down into the category of infrastructure. And then if you look at the next slide, you'll see sort of an example of just one of those areas, the technology. And we, we looked at the key technology features that would, would be the standard for delivery of online tutoring services. And you can see that these are, the, uh, these are some of the features that you would have that would really make this to, able to replicate a face-to-face -face situation with voice and video. Uh, um, and I might point out that we we're really looking at the standards as being um, the kind of standards that would meet a synchronous environment, not um, a back and forth asynchronous environment. Uh, you, uh, we're really looking at that uh, real time uh, interaction between the tutor and the students. Uh, but these are the ones that we thought were the, were the best. And one of the things that we found to our surprise that the students were really using were the archives. So the ability to archive isn't always available, but if you can do that, uh, the archives are tremendous. Uh, we, we got so many hits on the archives, we were able to determine that students were going back, say a math problem where they were stuck, they could go back on that tutoring session and review that again. They could fast forward to a certain spot uh, they could actually review a whole review session, for example, that was for a number of people. Archives could be available to just one person in, uh, or as a group that participated, or it could be made available to the whole class, such as an, a review session. So uh, again, this would be some technology features that you might want to consider uh, or to develop if you have that capability. 
So then the other two that we focused on with the standards was in training and assessment and evaluation. So training needs to be specific to the online tutoring um, environment and also based on research based practices, um, of course, using the platform and then other online tools and resources. And I know many folks are really focusing on this uh, with this quick transition to a fully online tutoring um, and just how to best train, you know, moving forward uh, for our tutors. And then the assessment evaluation, how are you assessing the service? How are you assessing your training, the tutors, and then the technology? And this would be just an example of a training um, a lesson. Uh, and at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, this is a, uh, was developed by uh, Kevin Resker, our graduate doctoral student, and myself. Uh, what we did was we tried to include in a four hour training session, and these were done on separate weeks, uh, a, a fostering interactivity training. And that's really important when you get back to that uh, category of meaningful engagement. In the online environment, you really want to engage the students as much as it, it can turn into a little bit of a lecture sometimes with the tutor just explaining things. So you want to have students actually get involved. We did all kinds of things to in, involve students and this was just a, a training session. Uh, you can see in the lower, uh, the picture there of the trees would be an example of an ebook. So the student could mention whatever page that page or they had a question about or a problem. You could, uh, the tutor was able to call that up and they could go right to that spot to talk about that concept or problem. Uh, we did uh, Jeopardy games. They did those for um, online review sessions where they created answers and the students had to come up with questions and they had a lot of fun doing games. So again, gamification is an important area to see what you can do. We also had tutors record uh, chemistry experiments on YouTube and, and explain uh, and go through that. So they were very creative in creating their own. All of our tutors were trained uh, and they could do two hours a week of online in addition to their in-person tutoring. But I think this training example just shows you if you can set up a set training for online in particular, uh, you'd be surprised in, at your tutors and how creative they can be. And looking at the assessment and evaluation piece, that's a, a, again, just looking at some examples here. You really want to be uh, comprehensive in what you're doing. You want to be able to evaluate the online tutoring program uh, and as well as evaluate your training and the tutor performance. Now, because these are archived in the most part, you have an ability to go back and review tutor performance on an online environment. And we even had them evaluate themselves by going back and reviewing their sessions. Uh, they could pick out clips of some of the best uh, interactions or explanations they had, which we kept for resources. Uh, and others could actually, they could do peer reviews of each other. The training program, we would have the tutors give us feedback. Uh, we actually had 30 training objectives and they had to meet those objectives before they could go online and uh, do tutor training. Some of this is uh, uh, mentioned for you in um, Learning Centers of the 21st Century, a chapter that uh, NCLCA has put out. Um, but again, you certainly can contact me if you need more information. Uh, the program needs to be evaluated and qualitative and quantitative is, is extremely important. Uh, you can get student feedback through uh, email questionnaires. You can uh, do interviews if you choose. Uh, again, uh, your numbers, uh, what, how many people are using it. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. And these are outlined in the standards, which are on the ACLA website. Thank you, Johanna. So like we mentioned, this was just kind of a quick overview of the ACLA online tutoring standards to help give you all some context and maybe some guidance um, for those of you that have quickly transitioned to a fully online tutoring program and maybe you weren't doing any online tutoring maybe you were doing just some of it um, but on the website you can find um, you can read the whole document and um, of course we're happy to answer questions as well. But I'm going to now stop sharing my screen and shift this over 
to our panelists because that is really where the meat of this all is to hear about what people are doing right now in their programs. So Edward, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks. I was waiting for that cue. There you go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to see 188 participants in our zone and we are connecting across uh, across countries actually, and so that's very exciting to see. Uh, I'd like our panelists, uh, we have a, uh, three esteemed uh, colleagues, uh, one from a research in university, um, one from a CSU, and one from community college, but I'd like them to introduce the, uh, themselves to us, and so I'll uh, give the floor to Araceli. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Araceli Badilla, and I am the Beacon Program Coordinator at American River College, and we are a two-year institution. Thank you. David? Good morning, everybody. My name is David Galvez, and I am the Assistant Director of OASIS, which is the Office of Academic Support and Instructional Services at UC San Diego. Welcome. And Timurhan. Hey everybody, my name is Timurhan Vanko. I'm the coordinator for supplemental instruction at California State University, Long Beach. Fantastic. And so the first question I'm going to ask is going to be to Araceli. How did you transition to a fully online environment? Uh, tell us a little bit about maybe what you've had and how you transitioned that to, uh, to go fully online. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Edward. Um, well, with our Beacon program, 30% of our Beacon tutors were already online. So I have been working on this for a, at least a, a year and a half to try to get more and more of my Beacon tutors who are working in a very um, similar SI model, supplemental instruction model. Uh, the tutor is linked to the instructor. So if the course is online or in hybrid format, I was encouraging them to, to do online. So like I said, 30% were already online. So, um, so it was an easier transition that way. Uh, the other reason I think that it was easier to transition is because they have an instructor and all instruction had to move online. The teachers had to either have a, a shell, a, a canvas shell, that's our LMS, uh, system, or they would have to be able to create a shell. The tutor would have to create a shell outside of the teacher's um, canvas shell. So that was probably the part that took the longest were those students who were just um, face to face and maybe the teacher was also fully face to face and there was no LMS component. So that, that was the one that took um, the most. And we did lose um, tutors in that process, in that transition, unfortunately, and we certainly lost groups and that means we lost students. Um, but like I said, I think the transition was a bit smoother just because um, we had been working towards that goal for, for almost two years. Can you explain a little bit about uh, how students signed in, uh, especially for apportionment reasons? There's a question that came from the chat. And I think other people want to know, like, how do you remunerate and document? Okay, yes. So <clears throat> when we were on ground, all the students had a check-in, check-out system, whether they, you know, um, and even if it was online, the students would, the tutors would still have to do what we call roll call. And they would need to record the session. So that just transitioned to everyone now. Everyone had to do the same. Um, all the sessions are recorded. We did receive communication from our general counsel through our district indicating that faculty could send an email to all students saying that these sessions would be recorded and students would have the option not to um, have their video on if they did not want to be you know, recorded themselves and they could always mute themselves. Um, so we did have that uh, communication that came to faculty about the recording. The tutors were um, you know, still required to now do roll call. Uh, we used to do this a long time ago before it was just all online. So um, we continue to ask them for that so that we could then uh, collect apportionment. And then the other piece that was really important, and it was probably the piece that um, 
some other colleges struggled with was the um, the supervised for apportionment piece, and and so my my take on that was no different than it when it was face to face. I was still available, and and so part of the requirement for the tutor was to submit that Zoom link to our program so we could include it in the database, and then I can just pop on in online like I had done in the past. I was just doing that, you know, 100% instead of 30%. Excellent. And uh, were there any FERPA issues with recording? Um, that was probably and still has been the number one question is, um, are, are we going to um, require, you know, that from students, like some kind of a written piece? Um, I just went with what the what the legal counsel had told us in regards to how we were going to do this because that's what the faculty received. Um, there's really only been one uh, group that has um, questions that, and so at this point, you know, I've kind of passed that on to the dean and said, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna have the dean, you know, um, follow up on that piece. Uh, but that was the only time that I think that it's really been um, an issue. Awesome. I'm going to move to the next question with David, and then we'll come back to you, Araceli, and as we uh, will have a question for everybody, uh, for all the panelists. Uh, David, how are you engaging students at UCSD, a uh, large university, and uh, I know you are uh, overseeing multiple programs, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I'll give you a little quick context about our program, OASIS. Um, we work within a cohort model. so we recruit our students to start during the summer. We have a summer bridge program. And last year we had about 300 students enter the program. And we work primarily with these students. So these students are first generation, historically underrepresented from under-resourced uh, communities. So the idea is they start in summer bridge, they take two courses during summer bridge. And what we're doing is we're really kind of trying to make a smaller community for them. Um, in which they can engage, uh, engage with their peers, or they know staff, they know faculty, so they already have a community coming into the, into the fall quarter when they start as freshmen. Um, as part of their agreement to you know, be part of OASIS throughout the year, they also are required to sign up for uh, academic support workshops. And these academic support workshops are just based on courses. So if you say you have a chem course, you know, you take that, you're taking the chem series your first year if you're a bioscience major, you have to take three chem courses there. You are taking them with that cohort. So there'll be anywhere between 20 to 25 students in an academic support workshop and you're taking it throughout the year. Um, so the tricky situation that we were kind of left in is, well, let me add that we, before uh, the the coronavirus crisis, 0% of our academic support was online. So, and we had had talks uh, that we were start, to, we're gonna start to move and have some type of services online in the future going into next year. Well, like many of you that, you know, we got kicked into gear, into fourth gear immediately and, and it had to um, come up with some services. Um, the trickiest thing has been really working within our cohorts and building community. So luckily we had the same facilitators. We didn't lose any tutors. Um, our tutors and our, our, our staff, our student staff was incredibly flexible. Um, the work really was in training. And, you know, as for many of you, you, you know, I'm sure you've had this, this happen also. These first two, three weeks of this quarter uh, um, were tough. Uh, lots of road bumps, um, you know, technical issues. We had, um, you know, students having issues with distractions and time management. Many of our students, you know, were then forced to go home and maybe they had to share a room with, with a sibling or two siblings. Um, they were telling facilitators that they had to keep their cameras off because, you know, they had chaos going on in the room. Um, we were, you know, we were in a situation where we were helping students with laptops. We were buying students headphones um, because it was hard for them to hear. Uh, we had students, you know, just trying to find a little piece of the, wherever they were at home to try to kind of like um, engage in these workshops. Um, another thing, because we are kind of, we focus on community and building that cohort, 
um, what we started to see was that the level of engagement wasn't where we were hoping it would be. Um, and I think that has something to do with, you know, um, Zoom and, and or whatever type of software you're, you're using. It's a hard, it's, you, you have to be a little bit more creative in terms of trying to find ways to engage with students. Um, you know, some students are in lectures, they're in front of a, a computer for already maybe four hours, five hours that day, and then there's a one hour support workshop. Um, and it's tough for them to kind of find the motivation to be maybe engaged that day. Um, so there's been a lot of, a lot of learning these, this, this quarter, definitely. Um, a lot of obstacles. Um, but I think what's key is having like a lot of communication with our staff, with our student staff, with our facilitators, and trying to get that back and forth and really trying to understand what's going on in, in these actual Zoom classrooms and in, in these workshops. Um, the, the big thing, like, like I said, is we're trying to do is continue to build community and build that cohort. And even in terms of students signing up, you mentioned of, you know, students signing up, we use a, an older software system called Matrix. So if anyone else uses Matrix out there, um, you know, I'm with you. Uh, and, and there's some difficulty there at times. Um, but we're trying to, you know, that's, that's a way we keep track of the students who are coming in. But what makes it easier is that these students have signed up for these workshops and they're in these workshops. We, we, we already know at the beginning of the year which workshops they'll be in. And in order to take advantage of some of the resources we have, such as priority registration, they are still required to, to come to these workshops. Um, so that has been helpful in terms of getting them into the classroom. I think the biggest obstacle though has really been um, trying to engage with the students in the classroom and trying to help them, you know, figure out some of these ob those obstacles that they're dealing with outside of the classroom as well. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, there's several questions. Keep throwing your questions out. I know that there's um, some questions regarding the software platforms. We'll get to those. Um, I'd like to go to Team next. We just hit 200 participants which is a milestone, Team Ron. And uh, that's your entree to uh, uh, answer this question. What additional training did you implement uh, when you had to go online uh, three, four, five weeks ago? Sure. Um, so kind of like how David mentioned, we did not have any pre-existing online services through our learning center, including supplemental instruction, which I'm the head of. So our training was very quick and it's ongoing for the most part. So to use a metaphor, I think many of us might've heard before, we're kind of building the bike as we're riding it. So when everything happened six weeks ago when colleges first started going online, uh, Long Beach first announced it was only gonna be closed for two days. Um, campus closed um, or courses canceled and then we'll resume online the week right after until about April 20th. And then very quickly after that, we got the updated order that the rest of the semester is going to be online and we'll actually have more than a full week where there's no classes. Um, during this time, pretty much all of our students, uh, student leaders and the students they typically work with also didn't want to come on, come onto campus out of fear that, you know, there could be a potential spread and things like that. So we had to grapple with um, kind of an interesting situation where we had to train them but many of them were very apprehensive or nervous or anxious about gathering in groups on campus. So what we did to just kind of mitigate the very beginning of our uh, of training is our staff is divided into cohorts as well, and each cohort's led by a mentor or a veteran SI leader. So we invited groups to come in one by one throughout one of the no class days. And on that day, we talked a little bit more about the administrative stuff behind um, everything that's going into the pandemic, what our services are going to look like. Um, we gave kind of a crash course on Zoom, its features, what goes into it, how to access it, a um, lot more of the administrative stuff. And then throughout this whole process, I'm kind of scrambling, trying to figure out what online is going to look like as everything's building. But me and my colleagues had the idea of also asking students, what technologies are you familiar with? What do you think you can bring into the SI like, classroom? Uh, virtually. 
So we actually had a lot of them do a brain dump activity where we just brainstormed and covered the whiteboards with different ideas, different technologies, how different activities can be shifted to a Zoom or something along those lines. And that actually really helped everyone kind of be on the same page with that it's doable and we're going to figure things out. So the week after that, we had no classes but our campus, we're, I'm extremely fortunate that our campus was devoted to making sure none of our students lose pay, um, given with everything. So we mandated that all of our students or all of our student leaders practice these technologies as a part of their schedule since they're being compensated. So I had them do informal SI sessions. So they weren't mandatory because classes were canceled. But if any students wanted a touch point, uh, they could practice using Zoom in that way. Um, because everyone's in cohorts, we also have them practice Zoom with each other. So really dig into the features like the whiteboard that comes with Zoom, sharing your screen, annotation on Zoom. So we had them work that their full schedule that week was completely devoted to exploring, exploring Zoom, practicing other features, looking for resources. Um, for, for synchronous training, we usually have a training bi-weekly where we talk about a topic of a topic of the training as it pertains to their job, like preparing for finals, incorporating academic coaching or learning skills, things like that. So we actually upped uh, their frequency and training to weekly. Um, so every other week would be a little bit more structured, but then those in-between weeks would purely be about troubleshooting what's going on and sharing ideas and resources and activities that we've um, that people have gone to practice and work with. So every week we have a touch point where we can share different ideas and things that are working and things that aren't working. And then synchronously, what we've done is we have an LMS page that all the SI leaders are connected to, and we've housed every resource we could think of on there. So guides for Zoom, uh, guides for utilizing chat technologies, how to uh, different online platforms that could be used in an SI session, like Kahoot, Online Jeopardies, Quizlets, Quizzes, things like that. And where and is this uh, located at in your... You it's, a, it's on our LMS page. Which so is, what, what do you use for your LMS? For our LMS, we use Detail Brightspace, and it's called Beachboard okay. on our campus. Okay. Um, but it functions, based on my experience, it functions really similarly to Blackboard um, and Canvas. So there's elements of both in it. Um, so we have different modules focused on different, different areas to just help them work on their job because unfortunately with the rapid transition to online, we didn't have a chance to really sit down, think through a, a training and then execute that training. Um, so a lot of it has been kind of week to week, talk, sharing resources, discussing strategies, and then we are, we're assuming that we're going to start online in the fall to some capacity, just based on everything going on. So we're starting to plan out our online orientation and really focusing on facilitating synchronous SI sessions um, via Zoom. Excellent. You're actually starting the next question to which I would like all panelists to answer. Uh, what are your next steps? And so if you can kind of go with that, uh, if you have anything to add to Mirhan, and then we'll go to David and then we'll go to Araceli. Uh, some of the things to think about that put in the chat are uh, the system that you're using, Canvas, Cranium Cafe, Pisces. So maybe uh, addressing those as you talk about next steps. And then also tutor recruitment, hiring, uh, training, and then the implementation. If all of that is online, then uh, how you might be doing that or what are you thinking of? What are your thoughts? Uh, we're not expecting you to have everything um, complete right now in your answer. Sure. Uh, perspective is important. So uh, the question for all the panelists is, what are your next steps? And so go ahead, Tim Rahan, you start. Sure. Um, so we've actually already started recruiting and interviewing and hiring, which has been fun, uh, to say the least. Um, to be honest, recruiting and hiring was not as big of a challenge as we originally anticipated. Uh, we lean heavily into re referrals from SI leaders, from faculty. Um, I'm knocking on wood, thanking the universe and whatever powers beyond it, that we, our turnover actually isn't very huge. A lot of our staff that was thrown into this online environment is actually returning next semester. So that wound up being really handy for us. Um, 
So we have an online application that's based on our the, it's based on Qualtrics, which is our campus sanction survey software. Um, we look at their materials. We invite them. We invite them to an interview. We've been conducting interviews via Zoom. So me and a couple other coordinators, we ask questions like we would in a normal interview. And then we've actually been asking folks to prepare a mock online a SCI session, even if they haven't seen one before. And this has probably been the most important piece of our interview process, because for folks that haven't been working for us already, it, gave, it gives us a lot of insight as to how their communication style adapts online. Can they still be engaging? Do they still have those intrinsic skills we're looking for? Um, and do they have the, just the communication abilities to work in this environment? Because right now we're currently planning that to go either way, depending on what's handed down to us from our chancellor's office. Um, in terms of training, we're still ironing it out. We're trying to get through staffing right now, so we haven't thought too deeply on it. But our logical next steps is to probably do some kind of mix of asynchronous training modules uh, through our learning management system on D12 Brightspace, and then do some kind of review and follow up with our um, with a synchronous Zoom online orientation. So our orientation in the past is four days, eight hour days. So far from just talking to my students and talking to my colleagues, nobody's gonna to wanna to stay on Zoom eight hours a day for four days a week. So we're thinking of expanding and adding more days to shorten a shortened amount of time each day. And then whatever can be turned into slides with some kind of assessment or tech for understanding in an asynchronous fashion, we're gonna to try to port it there. So we'll ask, uh, we'll ask all, all the SI leaders to complete these during the summer as they're added to it prior to our Zoom orientation. And Zoom orientation will really be about practicing using these technologies, interacting with each other, setting things up. Um, we might have, we're planning on having to make changes to our manual because some, because there is this layer of facilitating SI sessions online. So these are some of the dominoes that are being, being set up once we get past the last week of instruction and finals week and things like that. And and your budget can support all that? Currently. Currently, so, okay. Until I'm told Great. otherwise. Okay. Um, let's go to David. Um, what, are, what are your next steps, David? Thank you, t uh, So for, for right now, what we're working on is really just um, continuing to improve fostering meaningful engagement within within our classroom. So um, we've been working, you know, developing games, introducing games into the Zoom environment. Um, also, outside of just the the academic support, we're also starting to develop, develop different types of workshops. Um, we're having like social hours for students, for our cohort students. So it's not just about, you know, talking about a class or homework for a class. Um, you know, it's important for us to kind of continue building on that community. So um, we've put together a couple STEM focused career workshops on, on different types of career paths. And, and we have a couple social hours that we have depending on what interest or career interest or major a student is in. Um, so we could talk about maybe research opportunities, internship opportunities, how that looks like how that's, you know, what are the different opportunities moving forward in this environment. Um, so that's been helpful. Um, looking forward, um, definitely, you know, I, I talked about how we're currently using the matrix as, as a software system where students are registering for, for the workshops. We are looking at WC online um, and I've, I've been messing around with that a little bit and I think we're probably going to move forward on that next year. Um, so that'll be helpful. And then also, I, as I mentioned earlier, we, you know, we had 0% before, before this crisis started. Um, but even though the, we've, we've hit some obstacles, we also see that there's a need for online instruction that especially amongst transfer students, for example, transfer students who aren't on campus, transfer students who are working off campus, um, they have they've they're actually telling me that hey this is actually very very helpful for me because I actually I can go in and you know I can maybe be at home or be closer to home and go to a cafe that's near home and actually sign up for for online academic support so that's something that you know um, that I, I really try to 
you know, keep an ear open to kind of want to transfer needs. Um, and that's something we're try really trying to improve upon in our space. So there is going to be a component, an online component that'll stay with us for sure. Um, and I'd have to say, you know, through this, through this crisis, that's, it's, it's opened up different doors that we were there, but we just weren't looking at before. So that's really important. Um, and I'm trying to see here, I know, oh, for tutor recruitment and training, we actually do our, our training, our mentor, or our, our mentor and our tutor training uh, during the spring. We recruit in the winter. So we already had recruited our future tutors and mentors. And um, in terms of budget, we've been told that, you know, to create a budget that's 10% less what we had last year. So you know, we may have to cut a couple positions, um, but once again, those students haven't, have yet to be, be hired. So it's just, we're just gonna hire less positions. Um, but for the most part, we can live with a 10% with a cut um, for now. So uh, we're hoping that that'll, that'll kind of stay as is. Um, students are required to take a course, so, which is EDS 116, uh, which is titled Equity Minded Education, and then also um, take part in training. So, and that is all completed by the end of the spring quarter. So training is now going on, as Tim had, had mentioned, it's going on on Zoom. So that's, that's you know, that, that's had its moments for sure. Um, but students actually are able also, you know, usually students shadow when they're in person, but they've been doing kind of Zoom shadows. They've been invited into sessions, see how sessions are looking like, you know, um, able to give kind of feedback, able to also look at different types of Zoom, Zoom sessions. So actually the training has gone pretty well. Um, I'm more concerned if we then go in person and then these students have a working with students in person. So um, in terms of Maybe training- before, before we go on to Araceli, there's a yeah. question coming. Well, sure. uh, what, when you say equity-minded training, what's one, one component of that? Uh, like? So equity-minded training, um, you know, what will, one component that you may look at is kind of, um, well, let's look at kind of, I'm trying to think here of the syllabus because I actually helped out with can, it last year. We can come um, back if you like. No, it's all right. It's, it's kind of okay. like, you know, there's components of like culturally, culturally relevant uh, teaching and training. So understanding that there's a diverse classroom in front of you with um, differing identities, reflecting on those identities that you have that we're just, it's not just one identity, even like as an individual person, we have numerous identities that make us whole. Reflecting on that, understanding that, listen, like depending on these identities, people, maybe pe certain students see themselves as students first. Maybe they see themselves as sons and daughters first. Um, there's different approaches that students bring into the classroom that is then, that, that's, you know, influenced by those factors outside the classroom. So being understanding of that, being understanding of kind of there's different types of, of, you know, learning differences as well. And, you know, so when you're working with students, you're mindful of these things. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate yeah, your perspective and mm -hmm. uh, uh, stay strong in this uh, process. Thank you. Um, Araceli, uh, what are your next steps? Okay, so next steps. Um, well, we are also looking at, at planning for a budget cut. 15% is what our dean has told us. So we're going to go with a 15% uh, cut. Um, the, the training, I think, is, is probably the, the number one change. I am going to move all of our tutors all go through training, and that is a a course that they take. It's my class that I teach. It's a one unit and it was in hybrid form already. So I'm just going to transition it to fully online and that's going to include orientation, which is usually the day that we welcome the new tutors. In regards to the recruitment process, um, the recruitment process isn't going to change because it will remain the same. I recruit via the instructor. So how I recruit the tutors for the program is through the teacher. So that part is not going to, to change at all. Um, the, probably we are still gonna use Confer Zoom for fall. I, I don't see changing that just because we've pretty much at this point gotten the hang of it, so to speak, on a 100% online you know, uh, basis. So we're, we're probably gonna go with that. Um, 
I still, we still prefer for those Zoom sessions to be conducted via the teacher's shell, via the Canvas uh, shell that the teacher uses. That tends to be um, just so much easier. And then usually the tutor also is, is uh, present during the lecture part. So that's the part of that SI model that, that we talk about. So changing that would, would re require also that LMS piece change. Um, like I said, going fully online so that we, um, I've been observing, all of our Beacon tutors are observed um, every term. We try to do three observations per term. So those are now being conducted online. And so one of the things that I've noticed that I think needs to happen is uh, encourage and, and have the tutors practice doing breakout sessions, especially because some of those groups are, are between six to 10 students. From what I've observed so far is our, our group sizes are still very healthy, but we need to do a smaller session, kind of what they would be expected to do face to face. And so I, I want them to use that feature, which I don't think as many tutors are using it. Um, so I plan to use my tutor training course and that's the change that's gonna happen over summer when I move it fully online, is getting that component integrated so that the tutors can know how to use it and use the breakout session and the other features. So that's really um, the biggest change. And then finally, we are um, going to pretend that we're gonna be 100% fully online for fall. We have not been notified um, otherwise. But at this moment, I just want to go with that and plan for that. And then if it changes, it'll be just easier to transition into um, a hybrid format, which I think is probably what's going to happen for fall. Fantastic. Uh, wonderful detail for all the panelists. I, we appreciate you just kind of mapping that out. There's a question on the floor that was early on uh, in terms of Canvas, Cranium Cafe, Pisces. Those are all different. Uh, uh, interactive systems um, as panelists, and we have about we have about ten minutes left, but we need to reserve a little time for the ending. So let's say about seven minutes left. Um, how do you deal with uh, those uh, those features? I guess uh, whether it's Cranium Cafe, if you're using Pisces, uh, Zoom, you've talked about it uh, at length uh, in the Canvas shell, or the Core shell. Um, what um, what are the pros and cons? Well, I could just say that because my program is strictly linked to an instructor, I really need to follow what the instructor is doing for the sake of the students. Um, so I know my colleague is, is um, looking at other platforms like Pisces. Um, there's also uh, something that you know um, could be done with like appointment-based tutoring. I don't oversee the program, so I'm not as familiar with it, but I know that there are other uh, programs that she'll be looking at for, for summer and then possibly for fall. Okay, thank you. David or Timurhan, do you have any perspective on that in terms of uh, what you're using or what others are using that you might, might go to? Timurhan um, or David? Go ahead, David. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I was gonna say, I, I think, um, you know, we're using Zoom, primarily Zoom, but if there's one con I could touch on, it, Bon, is that there seems to be like an inconsistency on on which platforms are, are being used. Um, and like, I don't blame faculty or staff for this. It's just, I think some may be a little bit easier than other for other people. And it's, it's got to do with different styles. Um, but it, it affects the student. So there's some students who are like, you know, I, I like Zoom, I don't like Google Classroom, or I don't like going to Canvas, or um, so they'll spend more time on maybe the Zoom platform and vice versa. And I see just because we kind of, we're all thrown into this, that there are different platforms being used, at least at UCSD. Um, you know, I have students who are taking four different classes and they're using five different platforms. So, um, and it, it, I could tell that kind of like how they'll just like by default will pick one that they, they like the best and in turn they feel that kind of like oh because of that they might be doing better in those courses and because they're spending more time in, them. in the courses they're a little bit more engaged in those courses. So I think it's just um, you know like Araceli said it's important to kind of 
stay connected with faculty and try to see exactly what they're using and how they're using it. So we're trying to get better about those conversations to see, okay, exactly why are you using this? How is that helpful? Uh, how can we make that deliver that to the students we work with as well? Great. I'm going to interject, Timurhan. I know you might have something to say, but I'm going to throw in a question from the field here. How are how are uh, students being availed of, let's say, an SI model that's attached to a class uh, without really having that face-to-face? -face? You know, how's the the recruitment of that or the marketing of SI being done? So on our end, faculty, faculty have been really key. Um, we've been trying to be in touch with faculty as best as we can. Obviously, everyone has a different bandwidth with going online. Um, so in terms of recruiting, um, it's really been the SI leaders that have been pushing forward names. And we ask them, think about who's excelling now. Who's, who's still working pretty well given the circumstances and moving online, those are the folks we'd be really interested in seeing applications from. Uh, we have a really great team that really kind of buys into, that has bought into the job. So they've been probably our pivotal figures in getting us recruits. We've also asked if they have like colleagues, stu um, students that were in their SI sessions from past semesters. Um, so they've been the big recruiter uh, for us, every SI leader actually has their own LMS page that uh, that their users are connected to for that are related to also the target class. So that's also been kind of another touch point available to them. Uh, a lot of my SI leaders are bigger fans of the face to face and talking you know, talking synchronously, even if it has to be through Zoom than using um, than using their LMS page for recruiting or announcements or anything like that. So really it's been using students as much as I can to help spread the word and look for candidates and all of that. But faculty have also, we've had some great faculty partners that have also been really in touch with recommendations or just letting us know how things are going. We really emphasize relationship building between SI leaders and faculty as well. So we know faculty aren't talking to us, we know they're talking to their SI leader. And then they tell us, so it's, we, we try to have as many bridges set up in, like when we were face-to-face -face, and some of those bridges have been really pivotal. Uh, going back to that next steps question is thinking about how can we maintain this level of engagement relationship building if we start online um, from the beginning and not have these face-to-face -face opportunities. Thank you so much. Um, sure. We're coming to our, 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 almost our closing. I know that there's some questions about fall and it's, it's, they're all sort of hypothetical if people are going back uh, and there's, there's, you know, there's questions about social distancing, how do we do that? Uh, it's a little bit premature right now. I know we have to think about that. Uh, that might be another webinar in terms of transitioning back to the fall, that some people will be possibly going back and others might still be fully online. Like Araceli said, um, a lot of people are just planning for a full 100% uh, online and then whatever happens uh, might be a hybrid model. It might be, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to be fully all back like the way it's going to be uh, like it used to be. So uh, I think those are questions that we probably will not address uh, in this five minutes. Um, but I want to thank the panelists because uh, I think as you are working, uh, you are working examples of the courage, uh, the commitment, and the uh, ability to connect with students, I think, uh, first and foremost, uh, in terms of this crisis and how people are uh, delivering services. Uh, so I thank you for being uh, humble and sharing your state of, state of uh, the situation, if you will, right? State of COVID, um, and that you are uh, working through the obstacles and also looking towards the future and trying to perfect um, I really applaud those of you who didn't have any online uh, component and now are, uh, you're scrambling and now you're, you're, you're finding out what is it that you need to perfect. Um, and Araceli, I'm glad you were 30% online and that you, uh, uh, now you got that 70% to go, right? So um, with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Lindsay and uh, I will say that we will continue to look at the chat uh, up until 10 o'clock, 
Uh, we will not be able to address all the questions that you've put in there. Some of you have addressed some of, some of it with each other, uh, but we will go through that again. And if we can, uh, uh, in arrears, go back to those questions and, and answer those, and we will put that on our website and uh, provide that for the, for the crowd here, for the community. Uh, Lindsay, take it away, and uh, thank you so much, panelists. Yeah, thank you, Edward, and thank you again to all the panelists. Um, just as we close out here, um, like we started off with the ACTLA online tutoring standards, um, I wanted to share with you some really exciting news then for our organization. So we had been working on these standards for about a year and a half. And alongside with that, um, we were then also developing an online tutoring program certification. And after two years of work, um, the Council for Learning Assistance and Developmental Education Associations formally endorsed the ACLA online tutoring standards this spring, which serendipitously we couldn't have planned <laughs> in a million years with the alignment of, you know, of all of us moving to a fully online tutoring programs, you know, this fall or the spring. Um, but moving forward, thinking about where our programs may go, um, our organization is really excited to offer that support for folks. Um, the standards, of course, are the guiding principles, but then as you're building your programs in the future, and I think like many of us are seeing that um, we will likely have then a larger online tutoring component moving forward um, for those of us that didn't have any online tutoring um, you know, within our programs. So we'll be rolling out the application and the information um, this fall um, as that gets developed um, for you all. But we also have on the ACLA website a white paper um, that was authored by a number of the board members to give you some background about the certification with the standards, um, a pilot that we performed this past fall. And I'm gonna share my screen just very briefly again. Um, so again, you can go to our website, acla.info, that has information, uh, the white paper about the online tutoring certification, and that's on the same page with the online tutoring standards. So you can find the entire standards document to help guide you all, and then also uh, you know, a bit of abstract and history about the online tutoring certification that will be uh, formally rolled out this fall and that at that point, the application will be live um, and all of those accompanying documents. So we're just so excited to really support the field moving forward with online tutoring. And with that, I will close it out. And if there, unless there's anything else, um, Edward or any of our other board members would like to say, actually, I'll pass it over to Timuron. We have a survey um, that we'll be sending out just about this um, webinar. Is that going to be in the chat? Timuron? It's in the chat. It is. Okay, perfect. Post it in the chat. Yeah, I posted it a couple times and I'll post it at least oh, once thank you. or twice more. So, do you mind canceling your screen? Yeah, there we go. I just want to echo um, everyone's thank yous for being here. We definitely appreciate your presence as we. Thank you. Thank you. Don't mind muting their video. Are you right? That we should try to pay attention to it in the next few days. I think we're getting Zoom bombed now at the, with one minute just left. Just a bit, just a bit. <laughs> um, so I'm going to post a survey in our chat. Please complete it. We're already starting to plan how what we're going to offer or what ACLA is going to offer in terms of professional development in the fall. Uh, we're thinking of providing more offerings um, in each semester, maybe even uh -huh. setting up mini series devoted to certain topics. So like something like online tutoring that requires multiple components, we might have special spotlights on certain things. So please complete the survey. I just reposted it in the chat. Um, find us at our website at acla.info if you wanna reach out to any of the board members, see updates going on, things like that. And yeah, echo everyone and saying thank you for being here. We appreciate your presence and we hope to see you at future ACLA events. We have a webinar next week, a keynote speaker. Would you like to say a couple words about that real quick, Edward? Uh, I don't have the words. I just said <laughs> stay tuned for the webinar. I don't know the times. 
Not off the top of my head, 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock, Dr. Darla will join us and be the keynote uh, that we were going to have at the conference, and she'll be gracing us with her present with her presence. Sounds great. Um, that will be posted on the ACLA listserv. Um, so we'll include it as a calendar invite. We'll include a flyer and all the information you need to be able to tune into that. So I think with that, we can thank everyone once more. I'll post the chat one last, or the survey in the chat one last time. And thank you for attending. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, board members, for being in the background there. Thank you, everybody.